Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roland Guyton. I'm with the Interdenominational Theological Center, and I will be doing the introductions today since our host, Sebastian, Dr. Sebastian Manifold, is um, running a little behind on another matter at his institution. Um, luckily for me, it gives me the opportunity to, to introduce our speaker today, who is Ben Watson. He is a facilitator with the Internet Theological Education by Extension, which is ITEE Global International, where he trains pastors and church leaders so they can multiply generations of trainers, making discipleship and leadership training both affordable and accessible to third world leaders and pastors. Ben teaches online using screen reader technology and does occasional face-to-face training overseas as well. For this webinar, Ben is going to draw from his experiences of living through the development of screen reader technology beginning with its use in PCs and MS-DOS environments and going on through Windows environments and now even today where they're using on iPhones and iPads. He will approach this subject from the viewpoint of a user rather than the viewpoint of a developer. Ben is a graduate of Calvary University where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Bible. In addition, he has done work towards his master's at Luther Rice Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. He has been either an assistant or a solo pastor in churches in Kansas and Michigan. He was the director of international ministries at Source of Light Ministries International in Madison, Georgia, and helped move Source of Light's publications of their Bible correspondence courses into large print and braille and audio. In 2012, he retired from Source of Light Ministries International, and in 2014, he began to work with ITEE Global International. He has been married to his wife, Gladys, for over 44 years. They have no children of their own, but have spoiled the children of many of their friends. So, Today, I'd like to introduce you to Ben Watson as he goes over a presentation on screen readers. Take it away, Ben. Thank you, Roland, and it's a joy to be with you this week, and uh, I trust that the time that we have together will be um, rewarding as we talk about this matter of screen readers. A few weeks ago, I visited, had an appointment with a local doctor here in the city of Tahlequah, Oklahoma, where I live. As I waited for him to see me, I did what I always do. I listened to a book. When he came into the room to see me, I asked him to let me pause my book. I did, and he said, may I ask a cited question? Yes, you may, I replied. How, he asked, do you control your device? I'm sure he recognized it as an iPad. To answer his question, I removed the earphones um, and simply uh, swiped across the screen so he could hear the voiceover program read what was on the screen. Now, I'm sure that all of you have had some experience with screen reader technology, but just in case you haven't, I'm going to swipe across the screen just to give you a flavor for what this sounds like. This is using, this is voiceover, and I'm using a voice, all the voices have names. Uh, This is, uh, this is Alex. So he sounds like this. 
Friday. Press home to unlock button. I'll get that just a little louder and you can probably hear it better. Friday, May 3rd, 12.08 p.m. 12th of frock page two of three and page two of three adjustable okay i think that will give you i think that will give you some idea of what a screen reader at least sounds like in my opinion and not so humble opinion i might add of all the things that have been invented in my lifetime perhaps nothing has so influenced and changed my life as much as the computer and the screen reader have. I learned to type on a typewriter in seventh grade in 1959. And for 28 years, I regularly, sometimes almost daily, used a typewriter to communicate with sighted friends. In fact, I typed a letter to my wife's father asking him if I could date her. But the typewriter had its obvious drawbacks like the time I typed a letter to a pastor friend proposing a service in his church, but typed it in between a letter I had written to my grandmother. My, <laughs> my friend was kind enough to send the letter back and mention that in his response. But when I began using a computer with a screen reader, I could suddenly read what I had written, make corrections, and even translated it, translate it into Braille and send it to a Braille embosser. What a tremendous experience it was to write something that was readable for sighted colleagues. A friend of mine, and we were comparing notes, and he said that the first time he was able to do that, he said, I cried. Well, I didn't cry, but I certainly understand his reaction because it's a momentous thing when you realize that you don't that that you don't have to um, um, wait for somebody else to correct it or send out uh, bad copy or the, you know that kind of thing. You can actually do it, and you can even do it well formatted. So uh, that was such a, 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 a an, an exciting thing to be able to do. Well, what is a screen reader? Uh, again, I think you probably know the answer to this, but um, a screen reader is an application that translates any text on a computer screen into spoken words so that the blind person can hear what's on the screen. And that is a tremendously important thing to me. Since I regularly use, well, I shouldn't say regularly, I daily use this kind of technology and have for over 30 years. Now, I might add here that uh, now every screen reader uh, I know anything about interfaces with Braille displays so that instead of hearing, the blind person who is Braille literate can read the screen on his Braille display. That's pretty that's pretty uh, exciting. Now, are you aware that you probably carry a device with a screen reader already installed on it? Uh, if, you, if you carry an iPhone yeah. uh, or an iPad, that's the case. And so um, it, it just has to be invoked. And um, so I'm, I'm, I, I think it's pretty exciting that, that uh, we could do that and that you could actually experience the screen reader. But as wonderful as screen readers are for making the internet apps, courses, and digital media accessible, it just doesn't happen by itself. I read an article by someone who said that the internet was becoming more and more inaccessible. This is, this is from an article called there's already a blueprint for a more accessible internet if designers would learn it. And it's by Ann uh, Keto from QZ.com, and it was November 14th, 15th, I'm sorry. The internet can be a hostile space for 15% of the world's population who experience some form of disability. Try navigating a website as someone who is visually impaired. 
turn on voice commands on your computer, command A, plus, uh, pardon me, command plus F5. Uh, if you're on a Mac, this, uh, uh, enable, enable navigator. Uh, if you're on a PC, go to Amazon's Kindle store. What you'll quickly find is that those who rely on voice commands can't skip around and are doomed to listen to every notation about every page element before getting to the one piece of information they need. Let me pause just a minute to say that many of us uh, don't listen to everything. You, you eventually learn a, a web page and you, you, lear you learn to cruise around it and avoid some of the stuff, but it takes a while. <laughs> The article goes on to say it's a crime that the most versatile device on the planet, the computer, has not adapted well to people who need help. Uh, laments uh, Vint Serve, the uh, father of the internet, who co-authored the uh, NETS communication protocol with Bob Kahn. The 75-year-old computer science knows this pain point firsthand having been born with a hearing impairment and color blindness. The internet was a welcoming place when Surf conceived of it. Email for existence, for instance, originated as an assistive device that allowed the deaf to receive messages accurately. He developed his protocols in part to communicate with his wife, Sigrid, who is deaf. Surf often recounts the story about how she got the proper cochlear implants quickly when she communicated with doctors via email. It's a great equalizer in that everyone hearing and deaf uses the same technology, he said to the New York Times in 1998. But as websites got flashier, the experience um, has quickly become a source of frustration for disabled users. Despite the internet's potential to improve their lives, ordering groceries to communicating with friends, going online is an even more stressful prospect for many. A 2016 Pew Research survey found that only 40% of disabled Americans feel comfortable using the internet compared to 80% of able-bodied users. In the UK, less than 30% are online. And I'll stop the quote from that article at that, at that point. And I will tell you that this is my experience too. Uh, I am finding that Windows has become so complicated that I feel like I'm suddenly, um, uh, I, I, well, I think I was with Buck Rogers in the 25th century and now I'm back with Wild Bill Hickok in the 19th century or something like that. So uh, that's, that's where I'm having a problem. Uh, I've been uh, looking in recent weeks for apps, app, for apps to help me with both my Bible study and devotional life. And while I found some that are very accessible, I have found as many that are not. I've discovered apps that were accessible from the get-go, and I found at least one that wouldn't even let me sign in. In fact, uh, I couldn't get past the opening screen because there was nothing for the screen reader to, to read to even let me sign into the app. Um, one night here recently, uh, I had another experience that highlighted small but large problems with accessibility on a website. I was going to purchase a free course. Yes, that's what I said. Purchase a free course. Uh, by the way, I like free because I'm cheap. And so, um, uh, but anyway, I, I was going to purchase th this um, free course from a company that calls itself Credo House. I had the course in sight and needed to move to the next step. I perused the site and couldn't find the next step. After moving up and down the page probably 10 or 15 times, it finally dawned on me I should click on the link that very clearly said, Review Cart. 
I did, and before I knew it, I had purchased my item and then logged off the page. Now, um, I want to talk to you about, about inaccessible um, media. And uh, I'm going to have uh, Rollin put uh, a document up on the board. <coughs> And go ahead and share your share your screen uh, there. This is this is a uh, a uh, prayer list that my home church sends out every Wednesday, and uh, it looks like a perfectly good document, doesn't it? Uh, any of you um, listening now or listening later will be able to read the document. Now, the question is, uh, do you see what I hear? Now, what do I hear when it comes to this website? 12, 19, uh, you'll let me press home to unlock page two of three. And pass you'll let me get uh, my on. yes. Quick nap on. Tip three, tip one, two, eight, four, six. MNO mail done. Button. Now you've got the you you you're reading the the uh, the list right now. You're looking at it, yep. and it's perfectly good. Listen to what I hear. Prayer connection five markup switched unpronounceable. Nothing there. Unpronounceable. Middle dot list start. Unpronounceable. Middle dot. 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 Unpronounceable. 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 List end. Okay, you get the point. The the. Um, Work that's being done here is not accessible to the screen reader. It doesn't know what to do with it because there's there's nothing that tells it what uh, uh, there's nothing that tells it what um, th that that there is any letters on the screen because it screen reader just can't read it. So all it can read is meant is is middle dot middle dot, middle dot, and so on. Now, one of the difficulties for many students, and I'm thinking at the, at the undergraduate level particularly, but it would be a, it, it would be a, a um, I'm starting to lose my train of thought, I'm afraid. Um, the, the 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 screen reader can only read if if there's actual text that it can read and so um, um i don't know what they do to this one i do have a program that will convert the file so that it will read the text and that's a wonderful <laughs> thing but your average student if he has to stop and convert everything and go through a lot of hoops isn't it's going to spend as much time uh, making things accessible and go, jumping through all of those hoops as he's going to, to to spend studying and that isn't going to help him a bit uh, and it's not really go going to help his his overall education i recently was on the calvary university website and uh, i discovered that it is not completely accessible. I saw several places on that website where all it said was link, 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 but it didn't identify what the link was, what it did, and, you know, these kinds of things. And my appeal to all of you is label the links, um, label graphics, label all of these kinds of things label buttons there's an app that i use um almost every day called through the word and it's a wonderful app but it has many many buttons that are not 
properly labeled. And so I, I have to I have to guess, and I've gotten to where I can get around it. I was on their website the other day, and their website is actually quite good. Well, what do developers, um, need to do? Well, let me back up and ask it this way. What developers need to do so my screen reader does what a screen reader is intended to do? Give me access to your websites, courses, and digital media. Now, what about with graphics? Write some good alt text. Uh, that's alternative text. This is text that the screen reader can use, can see, but it doesn't bother the sighted uh, reader. They never even know that it's there. But the screen reader picks it up. And most every uh, program, whether it's WordPress or uh, something else, has a way of doing that. Mm -hmm. So uh, write some good alt text, uh, alt text and uh, graphics, label all buttons, and title all links. And if your link says click here, ensure that you have a short summary before the link so I know what I'm clicking on. Mm. Better yet, embody some of that in the link label itself. Now, if your course uses other than talking head video, make sure there's audio description for the video. Now, this is not an easy thing to do, by the way. You have to have somebody who who has seen the video, who can write short descriptions, and who can, um, vo uh, who, who can voice over those, those descriptions in a way that it, it doesn't take away from the things that uh, one needs to know. If you want to hear what that is like, if you've never heard <coughs> audio description, I recommend you go to moviesfortheblind.com. Uh, is it .org? Yeah, I know it's .com. This is a, a podcast where uh, a lady from, from uh, Canada uh, describes uh, old movies. She, she's fun. She's really good at this. Uh, she, she spent a lot of years at WGBH in Boston uh, doing this for uh, public TV programs. And she does a really nice job of describing uh, the movies that are that are available on uh, um, on uh, the Internet Archive. So that's where she gets the movies. So uh, moviesfortheblind.com is where you want to go. I also want to briefly introduce you to uh, an article I received some time ago that lists 78 links to help you with making your courses, websites, and digital media accessible. And uh, um, th this is something I'm going to be sending you the link to, um, and you'll have access. You'll have about 78 links to uh, articles and other things. Some of it will be more useful than, than others, uh, but it's a good start on, uh, on, on making um, your podcasts, your, your digital media, um, your courses, and your websites accessible to uh, your people. When I talk with disabled folks, I tell them, you need to do everything you can to make your own accessibility. And that's another whole, whole subject I could spend a lot of time with. Um, because I've, for the most part, have made my own accessibility uh, because it, there wasn't any place else to go. So it was either figure out a way to do it or it, it just didn't get done. Uh, to you, I say, help make these things accessible to your blind, your deaf, your uh, dyslexic, uh, whatever the, the disability happens to be. Make these things available to your students. Yeah. Well, um, remember, my, remember my friend who said, may I ask a sighted question? <laughs> uh, it's time, it's, it's sighted question time. For those of you who are with me, and I will just say that for those of you who are listening later, if you have a question, uh, feel free to drop me a note 
my email address is bwatson1122 at gmail.com. I'll repeat that, bwatson1122 at gmail.com. So if you have a question that we don't get to uh, or you're listening later, um, feel free to shoot me a note and I'll do my best to answer it. So do I have any cited questions? Actually, yeah, Ben. I, actually, I want to maybe start a little conversation because while you were talking, you know, me as a as an instructional designer, I do really understand what you're saying. You know, when you when you when you were saying it, because the technology for screen readers, not only the technology for screen readers, come a long way, but the technology for making things accessible to the blind has also come a long way. But I think one of the biggest issues for designers is a lot of times when we're, when we're actually doing the work, when we're actually creating the content, if we're not thinking about people with disabilities from the get-go, we just tend to train ourselves to just overlook all those fields. Good example, you know, when you're posting a, posting a, posting a picture, Almost every, almost every piece of technology in the world that allows you to post a picture on the internet, whether it be an LMS, whether it be a blog or whatever, gives you that alt text line. But most people just, you know, have conditioned themselves to just overlook it. Uh, yes, they do. And, and um, it, it, when you have to go back and do it, it's called retrofitting. Right, and uh, I heard a guy talk talk about this one time. I'd never thought about it, uh, but he he pointed out that it's always harder to retrofit a house, go back and make changes in it after it's built, right. and the same is the same is true with a with a course or or a website. Uh, when you have to go back and do these things, it, there's a lot of extra work uh, that needs to happen. You know, there are a number of myths involved here, um, Roland, and one of them is that if you if you make it accessible to a blind or a deaf student or or to someone who who um, may have sen uh, sensory issues, yeah. uh, you 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 do know that what is it between two and sixty flashes per second if you use flash uh, can can give a person um, uh, seeing it uh, seizures. Uh -huh. And I, I recently heard of, of, of someone who was very malicious and sent a message to someone at that, you know, using flash at that rate of speed and yeah. the person had a seizure. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And uh, so it's these kinds of things that we, that we need to be aware of. Um, one of the things I didn't, I didn't mention here just because I, I it, it wasn't in my notes, but it, it, I need to tell you that, I began using a screen reader in 1987, and um, the, the the screen reading technology was still pretty primitive, and it was it was uh, the the words were not always pronounced the best. Right. The word Bible became Bibble, <laughs> and and there were there were there were several others that uh, that came out really strange. The quality of speech was not good. That really improved in 2000 or so, uh, right. the late 90s, when they began using the screen reader, pardon me, using the sound card instead of a built a, a, a synthesizer card that you had to plug into the computer. Right. And uh, that was that was pretty poor speech, really. I learned to I learned to deal with it, you know, because I was either do that or do nothing. Right. And so, um, and I always thought I was, uh, I always feel like when it comes to technology, I'm about three hours late to the party and the guests are all going home by the time I arrive. Uh, <laughs> but, but this time I was not, I was actually pretty early for the party hmm. and, uh, the JAWS screen reader that I use now, uh, I use both JAWS and voiceover, uh, was developed for the first time in 1988 and um, I started using it in 2000 or 2001 when it was recognized or when I recognized that the one I was using which was Arctic Vision was not going to be able to keep up with the rapid 
expansion of windows and other technologies. And I think within less than a year after I stopped using um, the uh, Arctic vision screen reader, the company folded. Oh, wow. But uh, uh, I don't think I folded it, but uh, you know, it, it was uh, um, one mm -hmm. of those things that happened, but I recognized it couldn't keep up. Uh, one of the things I'm going to give you is a part of a, is, is one, one part of a five part interview with Ted Henter who uh, uh, developed the JAWS screen reader. And uh, I think you'll find it interesting from a historical perspective to, uh, to see how this works. All right, other cited questions concerning uh, our topic. Hello, Ben, this is Sebastian Mafut. Yes, Sebastian, welcome. Thank you, um, I, I was uh, uh, concerned that I would be late. I just came out of an active shooter training uh, which is actually relevant to this conversation since uh, they talked in active shooter training about, um, uh, you know, the fact that uh, you are going to have persons uh, who are deaf or persons who are blind, perhaps, uh, mm -hmm. who have to deal with these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, it changes the game. Uh, at least it's a game changer in terms of environments that are um, at risk or high risk at that particular point or at cr in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, speaking of environments in crisis, that's all of our educational institutions uh, that created um, online courses back in the late 90s and early aughts and didn't do the kind of retrofitting uh, that you're talking about um, mm -hmm. because the students who come into these classes uh, stumble in the way that you've uh, so ably demonstrated um, through materials that are not prepared for um, uh, for persons uh, who are blind or persons who may be deaf or persons you know who don't have the same um, physical abilities or technological abilities as the persons for whom uh, in their mind was the ideal student and uh, it's really uh, something that educational technologists and instructional designers uh, should um, keep in the front of their minds in every course build and in every uh, page build. So, uh, so you've excited me about this um, and about the importance of, of ensuring that, uh, that uh, these things are addressed from the beginning and not uh, in, as an afterthought at the end. Yes, and I, I, I'm 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 glad I've excited you here, uh, Sebastian, because it it really is important to uh, to think about it from the ground up, and and realize that you uh, that schools are likely going to have somebody who is uh, blind or visually impaired, and there that 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 is a legitimate uh, uh, designation because there there are many blind people who are not totally blind at varying degrees of, of, of sight. So that also includes the matter of, of, of them being able to enlarge the screen so that they can, they, they can read the course material. And so it, it, it really is important that uh, people keep these people in mind. Actually, what happens is that rather than making it difficult for uh, the non-disabled uh, student, it uh, when when one is concerned about accessibility and builds it in from the from the ground up, it actually makes things easier for the for the non-disabled student, because everything is just there in some logical logical fashion, and it's easy to find, and and it just works. Then you know, certainly, and there's a pattern and a flow that's consistent throughout the entire program, rather than one that is. Uh, dependent upon any given uh, faculty member's uh, personal preference. And uh, as you know, if you've got a, a program designed by 50 faculty members, you've got 15 different designs in your courses. <laughs> yeah, yes, you do. Because <laughs> we all um, think differently. You know, I can illustrate that, uh, not from, from online, but, but from a face-to-face a -face situation that I was in last year in India. Uh, nope. where we were teaching a group and we, we were teaching some things that we had taught, but uh, we all came at it from a different, from a different perspective. And uh, they realized then that we needed some 
uh, if, if we were going to train people to, to, to do what we did, uh, then we had to have something that was that uh, that was pretty, you know, came pretty close together. And, and so uh, rather than having rather than having 15 different uh, uh, ways of presenting the material, uh, we got it down to to a good way. And yet uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't detract from the from the personality of the of the teacher either. So uh, uh, I, I think that somehow that illustrates that to me, how important that is. Right. That's key, um, that the, uh, the teacher would still be able to uh, express his or her personality in that teaching and learning environment, but a teaching and learning environment that's designed uh, to be uh, completely accessible to all kinds of learners. Yeah. Um, yes. So I have a story, actually, about that. And I've got to oh. thank... Um, a student who came through Holy Apostles, uh, that's the school where I teach, mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, were designing a new kind of online program in 2011 and 2012. And this was a program that was uh, meant to be um, interactive, and meant to be instructor engaging with instructors proactively engaging students and so on, which back in 2011-2012 uh, was a different model uh, from what Holy Apostles had been doing. It had been doing a correspondence method using videos uh, from a, a place called International Catholic University. And it was a video-based correspondence course. So we had to change. And in uh, within a year of our settling in and redesigning this program and developing this program, a student named Jason uh, came to us and asked, would the program be accessible to him? Uh, because he was blind. He is blind. And uh, we said, well, if it's not, uh, we need to make it accessible. And Jason piloted the very first uh, course that was 100% accessible uh, to a person uh, without sight. And um, we followed him the whole 12 courses in the program, and we started implementing everything we learned from watching his movements into all the other courses. And I give our educational technologist at the time, Raul Lozada, a great deal of credit for staying on top of that and for making it possible for the 150 courses we have now. Um, I believe they're all accessible uh, to screen readers. I so, like that story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so good for, good for Jason. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah, he was great. He he came to the graduation and uh, he went up and he got his diploma and the uh, the uh, chapel just exploded in applause. It was um, uh, he was a real trailblazer for us and somebody who uh, helped us become a better version of who we uh, wanted to be or who we were at the time. So, uh, mm -hmm. if every school could have that kind of story, um, and if every school could benefit from listening to your story in advance of. Uh, of their first student who is blind, uh, then that would be a wonderful world that we would be creating. Yes, yes, it would. And uh, uh, I'll tell you, being a trailblazer isn't easy. Uh, I, I, have, I have spent my life be blazing, blazing trails for others. And, and it's, it's easy to get caught in the underbrush. And, and uh, you know, once in a while you get wrapped around a uh, a sapling and, and all kinds of things like that. But uh, uh, the final results are rewarding. So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm very glad for, for Jason and for, the, for, his, for his patience and stick-to-itiveness, you know. Uh, so it, it and, and for, your, for your people for um, hanging in there and learning from him. Well, absolutely. Well, when you've, when you've got um, that kind of an opportunity, um, uh, you don't want to waste it. <laughs> so uh, we knew we had somebody in there who, uh, from whom we had a lot to learn. And mm -hmm. it wasn't, he didn't move slowly. He moved at a normal pace and graduated two years, which is the normal time uh, mm -hmm. after injury, uh, which is uh, the, the fact that he could do that and we were able to keep up was a true blessing um, uh, to us. But um, I've got one other thought, and that is in your presentation, uh, you uh, provided your email address and yes. said that you were open to questions. Uh, would you uh, be open to reviewing 
uh, the occasional web page that somebody sends you and simply say, yes, it was, uh, I can get through this, or I found these bugs. I'd be glad to. Uh, then you are my next best friend because I just put together. <laughs> I just put together a few. And 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 one of them, you were talking about this free course that costs money. Um, I just created. It was a course uh, by Father Dennis Billy, uh, which was a free, massive open online course. But it required somebody to hit a button at the top of the screen, and then go to Vimeo, sign up for a Vimeo account so they could get the free videos, and then mm -hmm. come back to the uh, website so that they could do the class. And the entire time I'm setting this thing up, or a friend of mine, TJ Burdick, actually built it for me. Um, the entire time I'm setting this thing up, I'm thinking, you know, this may be intuitive, but if I were blind, or if, um, if there were some other impairment I had, would I know to click that main button in order to, uh, to get everything set off and, and get started? So uh, maybe that'll be the first one I send you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Be uh Feel feel free to do so. Just just be patient with me for a while because I'm I'm out of the country beginning Wednesday. Oh wow! Uh, you're traveling yeah. uh, where uh, to where? Kenya. Okay. Um, I I was in Tanzania last summer. Okay. And, uh, it is uh, such a beautiful world out there. They call it the cradle of life, and for a great reason. So if you're leaving on Wednesday, uh, you'll be there. Um, uh, at some point, I think the wildebeest are in Kenya now, and they'll be moving south. Um, oh. So I, I, I don't, I don't know if um, if uh, if you will have the opportunity to be surrounded by one and a half million wildebeest. That uh, it's a, it's quite a, uh, it's quite an experience. That would that would be an experience. I don't think so. We're going to be in the city of Nairobi the whole time, and okay. uh, training a group of navigator staff, uh, the thirteenth to the seventeenth. My uh, colleague and I are, are, are arriving on the 9th, and I, I kind of insisted on that so that uh, my body clock can reset. And not that it ever really sets, but, uh, uh, but at least it will, it will have a chance to set up somewhere between uh, uh, a couple of hours rather than being eight hours behind or eight hours ahead or whatever it does, you know. Sure, and yeah. uh, so... Um, but uh, we'll get there on, on Thursday evening, May 9th. Um, and then we don't start anything till the 13th. Our colleagues who are teaching with us get there on the uh, 11th. So we'll be doing some, we'll be doing some stuff, um, uh, actually meeting with one of the navigate with the leader of the navigator group there in Kenya uh, on Friday. So uh, uh it won't be completely quiet, but I'm looking forward to some quiet uh, after all the storms here. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, the worst part of it is the, um, is the plane ride. You know, uh, I, th I think we were on a plane for 14 straight hours. Uh, moving oh, over. Those, are, those are awful flights. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, what, uh, what is your role in teaching navigators? They have actually invited us to, uh, to come and teach them the method that we use. And uh, we, use, we, use, uh, we use what's called dialogue education. Uh, you may be acquainted with uh, the work of Jane Vela uh, from mm -hmm. Global Learning Partners. Uh, some, other, some other groups uh, use, use it. And uh, uh, so we, we use it because we think that was Jesus' main method, was dialogue. Uh, he did use lecture, but... Uh, uh, and other other methods as well, but it was it's largely based on on conversation between student and instructor and student, <laughs> and student you know. And I say that in our online courses, we have a we have questions that are called life notebook questions, and I said that's the time when the student interacts with God. So, uh, um, and and to some degree with me as an instructor because I get to see those those life notebook question answers from the, from the student. So uh, there's a lot of dialogue that goes on and that's, that's what we teach, which really isn't far from where the navigators are. And uh, so we have a lot there, there's a lot of compatibility. We will have some, some additional courses that we have permission to use. So uh, that, that's, that's how we're kind of hooked up. They invited us to come and, and train some of their folks who are reaching out to, to uh, pastors who have 
uh, no formal biblical education. Wow, what an absolutely incredible experience uh, that kind of thing uh, would be. That is, um, uh, you're, you're very fortunate to be able to travel uh, in internationally and give, uh, and give this kind of wisdom uh, to people willing and ready to receive it. Um, Can I so check I, in? I, I noticed, I was going to say, uh, Larry Hi. Hubbard has joined us. Uh, Larry? Hi, Ben. How are you? I'm fine, Larry. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Up to Good. my ears in it. You can imagine we launch our next semester next week. Um, I, can, I, just, I can imagine. <laughs> I just wanted to point out, um, now I did come in late, so I missed part of it, but I'm, I'm assuming it was similar to what you uh, presented down at Access. Yes. Um, my experience in, in being compliant is it becomes second nature. When I sit down and look to build a course, that's uh, the thought that's foremost in my mind. How do I make this consistent, on brand, and compliant? And as a result, the, the process of building a course becomes it, it becomes faster. I mean, the first one that I that I built was a slow, painstaking process. But as you systematize that, it becomes a much faster process, and you know that you're achieving the result that you're you're hoping for. Uh, another point I wanted to make, you know, you've been talking uh, about having a blind student uh, assisting. I have a student with a rather severe learning disability. She's done, oh, she's got two more courses to do. We just lined them up. Mm -hmm. um, and she she finds that the new version of courses that are built to be compliant are exactly meeting her needs. Wow. Which is wonderful. Yes, and it then is. It goes to the next step. Ben, you said that, or maybe it was Sebastian who said that, when you're doing this, you're actually providing a facility for everyone else as well. One of the most delightful complaints that we've had in the last semester is students going, I don't want to take a course in the old format. I want it in the new format because it gives me more flexibility. <laughs> so by being compliant, we're not only serving um, a marginalized uh, a clientele, we're serving our, our full clientele as well. And I think, Larry, that's an important point to remake <clears throat> because the, the myth is that if you, if you make it, if, if you build a website or a course to be accessible that you rob, oh, you'll rob some of the, of the, uh, uh, the pretty, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the color and all these things uh, away. And uh, that need not be true at all. Uh, you just you 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 do some of the other things so that uh, um, so that somebody say who's colorblind can still get everything that he needs out of the course. That's right. That's right. And it's you know what my experience is. It's not once you wrap your mind around this, it's not that difficult to do to implement. It takes me about a day to build a course. Okay. I got to learn from you. <laughs> yes, you do. Wow. Oh. Well, he's he's using Moodle and I'm telling you I saw one of those courses in uh late February and all I could say was wow. I was I was I was hooked. I was ready to take the, I, I was ready to take that course, Larry. I really <laughs> was. <laughs> oh, that was that was so much fun to see something that was so accessible because a lot of places aren't, and I'm sure that we have a long ways to go in uh, in in our um, uh, work with IT Global. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've said it may be that I'm going to have to learn to be some, uh, to be a, a, a developer and work with these guys a little more closely in that area. Yes. I don't really look forward to that, but it may it may just be that that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're they're open, so. Uh, whenever I find something that isn't accessible, I tell them about it. Oh, good. You should. Well, no, this this brings up a very good point, though, and that is uh, we can talk about page builds that are accessible, uh, such as using the alt uh, description tags and mm -hmm. um, ensuring that uh, we have a logical flow uh, and even perhaps have a table of contents on those pages that somebody can just click through uh, rather easily. Uh, but are there um, are there certain learning management systems that are better for this sort of thing than others? 
And are there some uh, learning management systems that resist this kind of, uh, this kind of implementation or integration? Hmm. Boy, I, I don't, I would have to say, I don't, I don't think so, at least of the major ones. I'm thinking of Canvas and uh, uh, Blackboard, and I've only seen one Blackboard course because I could never afford to <laughs> see too many, you know. Uh, yep. And Moodle, I've been, I, I've been very pleased that Moodle is as accessible as Moodle is. So, you mm -hmm. know, there are things that, the, that the, uh, the company can do and uh, then they need to put tools in place as well that can be, uh, you know, where, the, uh, where that can be done. And from what I can find out, we did extensive research on, uh, on, the, on the various course uh, sites. We didn't look at Blackboard because we knew we couldn't afford it, but we did look at Canvas and I was encouraged um, by that, but we ended up with, with, with Moodle and that's what Larry uses is Moodle, mm -hmm. so that uh, um, so that uh, it's it's possible for for uh, a person to take the built-in tools and uh, and accomplish a great deal. So yes, the, yeah, the LMS shouldn't be an obstacle. Is the point? So if we're, if we're searching for LMSs that do this kind of thing, um, right? Uh, we should. Uh, uh, we should be able to find uh, one that will work for us. And then the next step is to ensure that the content that we place into it uh, has the accessibility that's necessary for persons uh, who are yeah. um, behind or limited sight. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think the content, if, if the, if the, if the LMS has the, has the tools, then you can, you can put the content in and make it and make it much more accessible. Larry, you want to comment further on that? Uh, yeah, I find that um, with Moodle, with uh, Blackboard, and with Canvas, uh, if you stick to their default settings, uh, they're built-in compliant. Um, and what I found in, in the last semester since getting back from uh, Mississippi is explaining to professors, do not set your font size. Use the default settings because they're compliant and your default size is not. <laughs> oh, good point, yeah. Uh, there was a, an interesting presentation down at Access that I went to, uh, an instructional designer at a Biola, and at one point she held up two different Word documents. They looked identical. One was compliant, one was completely non-compliant. And the difference between the two of them was very simple. In the non-compliant one, the professor had sent uh, font sizes, had sent colors, all kinds of things. But in the other document, the default heading levels of uh, built into Word were used. So in one case, they, they looked identical. In one case, the coding was embedded. In the other, the coding was not embedded. And so now as I go forward into uh, the next semester and over the summer, part of my responsibility is to put together the checklist for professors. What do they need to be thinking about in terms of compliance? And it's really coming down to two major points First of all, use the defaults of the learning management system. And secondly, use the defaults in Word. And you're going to get very close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point, uh, Larry. And I, 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 since I'm not a developer uh, or an, an instructional designer, I want to keep that in mind uh, when I talk to people about that because um, – the if if the defaults are as you say uh the best way to go uh why why tinker with it you know i can see where i can see where a professor might like a certain font better uh or a certain color scheme better um uh, but if you're going to if if we're going to uh if we're going to uh, uh to make it accessible to all of our students then if those default settings do it, let's stay with them. Exactly. Exactly. You know what it's like? It's uh, when we first uh, found PowerPoint as a tool that we could use in the classroom. Uh, uh, you know how um, uh, many people uh, took uh, a PowerPoint and would put a background behind it and would put a bunch of different colors and fonts and then put noises and zings and bats and things like that. And then the next slide would be completely different. 
Mm -hmm. And um, uh, their goal was to entertain uh, whoever it was that was standing in front of them. But um, that kind of design uh, was probably uh, really jarring, you know, to anybody who was trying to follow it in a logical fashion, yes. uh, especially, you know, if they were um, persons uh, who were blind or if they were uh, persons who had um, other kinds of, uh, of disabilities, such as um, you mentioned earlier, uh, the, you know, the, um, the ability, you know, the capacity to fall into a seizure. So, um, but I think that uh, the innovation of uh, the average faculty member is such that they don't want the default settings. They want to do something that's unique uh, to themselves in terms of their manner of presentation. But they're right. not thinking, yeah, they're not thinking about a disability access at that point. They're thinking about what they think would look cool. Yes, yes. Well, I think it, it's, uh, there's always a tendency, and I, I have fallen into the same trap of, of, boy, I got this cool program. How can I make the greatest use of it, you know? Right, sure. <laughs> I, I, did a, I did a message one time. Uh, sort of a, uh, a new story and comment. Uh, what does how how does the Bible bear on this particular news story? Only did it once. Uh, I decided afterward it was a bad idea. Uh, it may not have been a bad idea for that for that one time, but I wouldn't do it very often um, because I had access to a news service. Mm. Uh, and that was why I did it. I was I was using that news service to demonstrate what uh, what I could what I could do, you know. <coughs> and the people in the church were very gracious, and and uh, you know they told me I'd done good and I knew better. <laughs> but there is that tendency to do that, you know, to make to make a uh, you know to do something because we can. Right. We we should be more like. Um... Uh, like Dragnet, like Joe Friday, just the facts, man, you know, uh, uh, make certain it's accessible. And then anything else that, that would be pretty uh, window dressing, make certain it doesn't um, uh, get in the way of that accessibility. Yeah. Somebody called it eye candy. Mm -hmm. And there may be something to that. No, I think, uh, you know, you still, you, you want your, your site, you want your course uh, to be, um, to be uh, visually appealing, and I think that's an important um, an important point as well. So, you, but I think you can have it both ways. Certainly. Well, um, we have reached the end of our time. Um, is is there anything, uh, Ben, that you would like to uh, say as a final word to um, to your listening audience? Well, I think I think that. I come back to the to, to the same challenge. Uh, remember that uh, that all people are created in God's image. That uh, the that the Great Commission says that we are to go to all nations. We're to preach the gospel to every creature and make disciples uh, in all nations. And uh, if all means anything, it means all without exception. And therefore. Uh, when we're when we're thinking about education, uh, we're thinking about not only training the uh, about training the uh, the uh, student. Uh, pardon me, about training the sighted student or the the non disabled student, but also the the person who has uh, other physical or uh, motor issues or you know, whatever it happens to be so that they too can learn because uh, they not only uh, should be discipled, but they should also be makers of disciple makers. Well, that's, uh, that's very aptly put. Um, well, uh, Ben Watson, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, thanks uh, to the guests who, uh, who are with us, especially to Rowland who provided the introduction. Uh, this has been another presentation by the Faith-Based Online Learning Directors Group uh, in partnership with WCAT Radio and with um, uh, the other uh, 60 schools uh, that are part of this organization. And I hope that as uh, members of those schools or uh, our members of the fa uh, FOLD, Faith-Based Online Learning Directors, 
uh, come to this presentation and listen to it, that they'll profit uh, very much by it because, uh, Ben, it was very excellently prepared and delivered. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Mm -hmm. All right. God bless everyone and have a great day. You have a great day too, Sebastian. Larry, good to see you and uh, uh, others. And like you say, if you guys have something you want me to see, I'll be glad to, uh, I'll be, I'll be glad to, uh, to look at them. Terrific. All right. okay. Take care, Ben. Okay. You do the same, Larry. Shall do. See you soon. All right. God bless everyone. Bye-bye now. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.